And based on such evidence, you're saying that humans have a 90% possibility of influencing climate change. Correct. Correct. That's Actually, it'll be a little bit higher. But yes, by, in the spring. Mar <laughs> in the spring, it'll be a little bit higher. Yeah. So if we have a 90% possibility of influencing climate change, do we have that much influence on reversing the damage that we've inflicting it on the It won't be easy because the damage, once we have begun this process, and I'm not saying that we, in, we intended to do it, but mm -hmm. once we went down this route, the problem we have, practically speaking, is the molecules of greenhouse gases, I'm not going to go into chemistry, I promise, uh, <laughs> that are, you that are the in the atmosphere. Looking <laughs> That's right. <laughs> They last a long time in the atmosphere. So it's going to take a long time, no matter what we do, mm -hmm. for this process to reverse. Okay, so that's, the, that's all that I want to say on that point, that we want to, we want to be careful about, uh, about having too high an expectation that we can turn it off mm -hmm. immediately. But to your point, can we actually reduce? If I could just go back to that very nice invention of Samsung, 90% mm -hmm. reduction in the energy requirement, mm -hmm. better picture, better set of services coming from that mm -hmm. television. If we use our intelligence for this purpose, yes, we can reverse the damage that we've caused. It'll take a while, mm -hmm. but we can do it. So we'll talk about more environmentally friendly sources of energy then, Great. renewable energy, of course. Um, we talked about solar. What are the other examples of renewable energy? So we have a, a lot. We have a very large menu of, uh, of renewable energies. Mm -hmm. uh, wind is one that people often know about. Mm -hmm. um, it's very place specific. You have to find where the wind speeds are uh, blowing at a level that technology can, can harvest. Uh, but a very good one, very practical one about three meters below the surface of the Earth, the temperature is a relative constant. It's a constant in Fahrenheit about 55 degrees, 50 degrees, 55 degrees. Mm -hmm. If we use that temperature to warm or cool our buildings, instead of what we do now, when it's really cold outside, mm -hmm. we try to heat cold air. Why not use what's called geothermal uh, energy options? Mm -hmm. Another very good one is bioenergy. Mm -hmm the use of uh, biomaterials to, we have to be careful, we don't want to use food uh, sources uh, for, uh, for energy. But uh, it's not bio banana skins then? Bio no, mass, like we could use, the, <laughs> there's better than banana skins, but there are a number of options that we can use of that, of those materials. That's right, you have the, you have the essential point. So bioenergy, wind energy, mm -hmm. um, uh, geothermal, and of course solar. And you said earlier that in addition to solar energy, which is probably going to become very commercially and um, affordable, yes. commercially available and affordable to, by 2015, you said. Yeah. What about the other sources? Will they become um, yes. affordable and available by yeah. then too? The uh, wind resources where you have good wind are already commercially available. It's mm -hmm. why so much wind has been invested in, uh, for example, in Europe, because it mm -hmm. is commercially competitive. Okay. Um, geothermal, sometimes you get a, a neglected source. I think geothermal is the neglected source. Mm -hmm. Just a couple of meters below the surface, we should be using uh, this, this uh, resource for, for our buildings, and we're failing to do it. It's a very practical technology. Mm -hmm. It's already cost effective. Uh, one that uh, actually both China and Korea do well at is uh, solar thermal utilizing, you put your uh, water uh, uh, storage units mm -hmm. on the surface of, uh, on the roof of your buildings yes. and you let the natural heat of the sun mm -hmm. do some of the pre-warming so mm -hmm. you need less energy overall. Again, a very practical mm -hmm. technology. You're using it a lot here. I wish the U.S. would use it more. I'm not sure how efficient it is in the winter time, though, when we don't need so much icy cold water. That's right. right. <laughs> we, need, we need hot water. <laughs> you need to insulate. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So let's talk about another uh, I think we call it clean energy as well, nuclear energy, yes, isn't it? Yes, yes. Um, a lot of debate over that, of course, because of the fallout of Fukushima, Germany, yeah, yeah. and many other countries are saying they're going to reduce or get rid of their nuclear power plants. Yeah. I actually read recently, so that has actually led to greater CO2 emissions from Japan and countries like Germany. It can, what, if you don't plan properly, it can. What is that your is view correct. on nuclear yeah. energy? So you mentioned earlier about solar, and we've been waiting for 30 or 40 years. Yes. I don't know if you remember, but there was a famous American scientist who said that nuclear power in the 1950s would be too cheap to meter. We're still waiting for the too cheap to meter <laughs> nuclear power. Um, it is a costly technology mm -hmm. and it has obvious risks mm -hmm. uh, that the recent unfortunate event, events in Kushima 
uh, remind us of. But we've had it in my country, we've had it in Europe. It's, it's a technology that has a lot of risks. And even if you're not having uh, an accident of some kind, as Korea recently experienced, if you're not careful, mm -hmm. even small switches yes. that don't seem to be all that complex, when you have to watch carefully how mm -hmm. they are made and whether they meet stress and other kinds of tests, mm -hmm. it's a very complex technology. I think that nuclear power is in the same situation as landlines. It's what's called a centralized, they're a central station technology, mm -hmm. and I think we are in an era through microelectronics and others where we are downsizing our uh, technologies rather than upsizing. And so I think nuclear power is going to have a great difficulty competing in uh, the 21st century. Mm -hmm. It's the landline against some of the other technologies like energy efficiency and solar mm -hmm. that are the cell phones. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think it'll be able to last the competition. Mm -hmm. So nuclear power plants and solar energy, renewable energy, that seems um, to be yeah. up to companies and governments. Yeah. But what can we ordinary citizens do? There must be some ways that we can also increase our energy efficiency, if that's possible, Absolutely. or conserve energy. What can we do? Absolutely. There's lots of things that we can do as uh, uh, just ordinary folks. When you go into your, to the store and you're buying uh, new stuff of whatever kind, uh, we not only need to look at the price, we need to look at what is its performance rating and make sure that we choose the better performing option. When you do that, yeah. the higher efficiency TVs as they make their way in, that's going to be a huge saving for everybody and that's driven by us. We can make those choices. We can also make it in our own personal affairs in our homes. We know how to use less energy in the home. Uh, we've always known how to do it and uh, a lot of times uh, it takes our children to remind us who tell us, mommy, daddy, you need to turn off the light, or mommy, daddy, you need to recycle the newspaper. Or, Mom. All of these are very practical steps that we can do, and it actually is good for our planet, and it's good for our children. So we are making a difference when we, we are just making a difference switch off the lights. That. Yeah. So when did you uh, become interested in, in energy? <laughs> were, were you a, an energy nerd from a very young age, excuse the term, but were you always this interested uh, no, in energy? No, I welcome it. That's who I am. <laughs> I know. <it's laughs> I became interested uh, in energy in the 1980s when it became clear that we were going to make a shift from one energy system to another. And uh, I, at the time, had been looking at other technology options mm -hmm. and had been looking at uh, some different economics that might make it work. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the 1980s were the time when we were, uh, began thinking about maybe we need to think about a different approach. And so on your earlier point, uh, uh, my first book that I edited with colleagues mm -hmm. was called The Solar Energy Transition. It was published by the American Association for the Advancement of Science in 1983. Mm -hmm. I was probably a little bit optimistic. <laughs> but uh, that's, that came out of that early interest in seeing a change mm -hmm. in direction. And what really interested me was how can we do that? How can we do a scale kind of change like that? That's what attracted me to the field. I don't remember 1983 that well. I mean, I wasn't a baby, but was there a lot of talk about climate change or environmental damage and need, or, need for greater energy efficiency even then, so 30 years ago? Some, that's a very, very good point. Yeah, actually, in the 70s, because of the oil embargoes, it was uh -huh. really the cost of energy that was mm -hmm. driving mm -hmm. the interest in change. But along the way, actually, the early 1980s is when some of the earlier evidence that had been documented in the 60s and the 70s mm -hmm. now became more widely known beyond the scientific community mm -hmm. that there were some signals here that there were some problems. Mm -hmm. So it actually does begin during that period. Okay. Well, Professor John Byrne currently serves as the Director of the Center of Energy and Environmental Policy at the University of Delaware. So let's pay a visit to the University of Delaware, which is a pioneer in energy research. The Center for Energy and Environmental Policy at the University of Delaware was established in 1918. The center has a diverse body of researchers with backgrounds in economics, sociology, geography, philosophy, engineering, urban planning and environmental studies. 
They work together to address a wide range of environmental issues, including climate change and energy transformation. We need a different paradigm, a new paradigm that can be built on a different relation between energy, environment, and society. One that is built out of the principles of conservation and renewability. CEP invented the sustainable energy utility to embody those principles and to begin the process of moving us to a different uh, paradigm and hopefully a different future. CEP's thinking is based on the principles of stewardship, shared responsibility, and the commons. We're committed to a future based on justice and sustainability. We recognize the importance for all societies and ecosystems to have access to health, safety, and security. Researchers at CEEP developed an innovative model called SEU, Sustainable Energy Utility, for redefining energy use. Through this and many other endeavors, CEEP seeks to advocate for energy and environmental policies. Maybe it's because I'm a Korean, but it's quite surprising to see a university that is more advanced in energy technology and policy than a government or a public agency. Mm. How did it become a center of excellence in this field? <laughs> Well, I think universities at least are supposed to do that. We are supposed <laughs> to be working on the leading edge. I'm not saying that we do it well all the time, but that is what we're supposed to do. And I, uh, in the case of the University of Delaware, there's actually a very good explanation for why uh, we really focused in on this matter. A lot of the energy uh, challenge mm -hmm. is uh, a combination of engineering and economics. The University of Delaware it has been a long time uh, uh, supported by uh, the DuPont family and the DuPont Corporation, mm -hmm. which is engineering uh, excellence, mm -hmm. and our economics has always been uh, very strong as well. So it mm -hmm. was an issue made for my university to combine engineering, economics, and then policy. Mm -hmm. And that's what we've tried to do, is to put those three together. Our students take courses in all three disciplines in order to get degrees in the field.